Well, good morning. And good morning to you that are watching this online. You'll notice things are a little bit different this morning because I'm using uh, a phone to record this and to, to go live with this instead of the, the usual setup. So I, I'm just experimenting. Um, and I thought also I'd get a bit closer to you. Uh, and so you might notice that it is actually me underneath all this hair. Um, so um, I'm, I don't know about you folks, but I'm really looking forward to the hairdressing. Yeah. 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 Um, so I really don't like this look at all. Um, I'm not really very conscious about how I look, to be honest. But I, as you can see, my hair goes very kind of wavy and girlish, really. Um, but it gets a bit longer. No comments. No comment. Well, I'm going to comment if you like. It's okay. I've got thick skin, four shoulders. Okay. So anyway, the Lord bless you. Love you to have you with us. And uh, we'll, we'll start with a short time of worship. And we're going to start with blessed is your name. At least I think we are. Yes, 
just two things. I was looking something up. This sorry? You need a mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. I was too busy looking something up. Okay. I uh, was just looking something up to um, use, but I won't do that. Um, just to say two things, really. Uh, Barry's already mentioned Good Friday. And uh, to say that we're having all the folk here, hopefully you'll have seen the email, but if you haven't, or if you're the folk that are uh, watching us this morning and don't get the emails, to say that Good Friday morning at 11, we will have a, a service here. Uh, it'll be a meditation sort of type service. And uh, we're using material next weekend from Jay, <coughs> Jay John again. Uh, we used uh, some stuff he prepared for Christmas, you might remember. And so we're using that on Friday. Uh, some thoughts will come up and give you time just to think about that and to pray and to move on. And then on Sunday, it's... Oh, good. Are you excited? Yes, we said Wednesday we should be excited. Uh, because somebody, I was looking for the quote, somebody said something like, why is it Christians look so much like Lent and not Easter? Uh, and we need to uh, just look like Easter, make sure we look like Easter all of the time, but especially next week. And, and next week at 11, again, uh, and that's using music by with Graham Kendrick, uh, uh, Sheila Walsh and all sorts of people. Bear Grylls is giving testimony as well during that sort of thing next Sunday. So uh, that's something to look forward to next weekend, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, both at 11. Okay, so we're going to move on and we're going to sing our next song. I could sing of your love forever. Because one of the things about Easter, of course, it's a demonstration of God's love. And that love goes on forever. Uh, doesn't matter what you've done in your life, what you do today, or what you do in the future, that doesn't change God's love for you. And those of you who, who have got children, will know that whatever your children do, okay, you might get cross with them, you might even fall out a bit with them occasionally, but it never stops you loving them. And it doesn't matter how far away they are. Our son and his wife and grand, our grandchildren live in Hong Kong, which is pretty much the other side of the world. But it doesn't change the way we love them doesn't change the way they love us either, which is good, they really keep in contact. But, so, so therefore, we're going to sing from God's love. I know 
never know how much it costs to see your seal upon that cross. Well, it cost him everything. And so now what I want to do is give you an opportunity to worship in prayer with him. And Colin will come with the mic. We're aware, Lord, of the passion in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, when you knew what you were facing, and yet, Lord, you went through it because of your love for us. Lord, that you knew that when you went on the cross that you were going to take all our sins on your body. And Lord, we thank you so much that you loved us so much that you went through that terrible pain. Lord, we can't even begin to imagine. And the terrible pain of the separation from your Father. Lord, separation from God. Lord, we are aware that you were in such close contact with God all through your time here on earth. And Lord, help us to be close to you all the time. Lord, help us during this time of the Passion Week, to get closer to you, Lord, to know more and more about you. Amen. Okay, we'll move on to our next song, At Your Name.
Well, good morning. I'll be ready in a minute. I think that's all. And I'll just read a few verses from Matthew chapter 21, if you have your Bibles. I'll still read it if you haven't got your Bibles. As they approached to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to a village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them the Lord needs them, and he will uh, send them straight away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your God, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those following shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered 
Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The next day, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling drugs. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Word of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So it was almost Passover and about two and a half million people were expected in Jerusalem. Not a large area, about from the beach up to ESK Square. Two and a half million would be there for the Passover. Many people were speculating whether Jesus would turn up. The chief priests and the Pharisees were saying that if anyone finds out where Jesus is, they must let them know so that he can be arrested. <coughs> John chapter 12 tells us that it was six days before Passover and Jesus arrives at Bethany, the, the home of Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha, about two miles from Jerusalem. And he makes his base there for the week. You used to be able to walk it in not too long a time. Now you can't because they've built that security wall there and you have to go about 10 miles around the other way. Anyway, the vast crowds were coming to Jerusalem from Galilee, from the Decapolis, from Jericho, from around the Dead Sea, from the Jordan Valley and across the Jordan, they would all come on the same route up from Jericho through the mountain pass to Bethany and on to Jerusalem. So vast numbers would have known that Jesus had arrived and the word spread and large crowds of Jews found out where he was, where he was staying and wandered out to see him. And to see Lazarus, of course, whom Jesus had recently raised from the dead. The chief priests decided to make a plan to kill Jesus and Lazarus as well. <clears throat> the leaders of the Jews were getting themselves into an impossible position, especially the Sadducees to whom the priests belonged. They felt threatened politically. The Sadducees were the wealthy aristocrats. Um, they were those in close collaboration uh, with the Roman government. Their aim was to ensure their own wealth, uh, their ease and their comfort. The Romans allowed all their subject peoples a certain amount of self-government if there was no disorder. But any trouble was dealt with by the Roman army and the local government would be sacked. It was replaced by direct rule from Rome. The Sadducees saw Jesus as a rebel leader, stealing the hearts of the people. The atmosphere was electric and the Sadducees were determined to be rid of Jesus in case of an uprising which would mean their position was threatened. They also felt threatened theologically. Unlike the Pharisees, who believed in both the resurrection and in angels, the Sadducees didn't believe in these things. And being confronted with Lazarus, having been raised to life by Jesus, they wanted to get rid of both Jesus and Lazarus. The following day, Jesus planned to join the vast crowd. And this is what's known, of course, as Palm Sunday when Jesus was about to proclaim himself King, Messiah, Son of God. But we can also see certain human aspects in this passage as well. First of all, we will see Jesus openly accepts the praise of the people. Secondly, we will see the sadness as he weeps over Jerusalem. 
And thirdly, we'll see the anger as he reaches the temple. So first of all, Jesus accepts the, the praise from the crowds. It was the custom of Hebrew prophets uh, when from time to time people wouldn't listen to God's word or in fact didn't seem to understand it to enact a piece of drama. They put their message into a picture that the people couldn't fail to, to see. For instance, when God wanted to tell Solomon that his kingdom of 12 tribes was going to be divided and his son would rule over a small part of it, the prophet of, called Ahijah took a cloak and tore it into 12 sections. He gave 10 to Jeroboam and only 2 to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. And Rehoboam reigned over just the two southern tribes, while Jeroboam was crowned king of the ten northern tribes. When Jeremiah wanted to tell the kings of Judah, Edom, Moab, Tyre and Sidon that they would be conquered by the Babylonians and would have to humble themselves before them, in fact have a yoke be put round their necks and they would have to bow their neck, he made himself an ox yoke and he wore it around his neck. The prophet Ezekiel took a clay tablet, drew a map of the city of Jerusalem on it. He drew a picture of a, a siege, siege works and battering rams to show that the people what soon would happen. And now Jesus realises that he's got to do something similar. The people wanted to make him king, king of the Jews, to throw out the Romans and, and to rule Palestine. They wanted him king because... If any of their army was injured in the battle, he could heal them. If any of them was killed, he could raise the dead. They didn't need to bring a lot of food because he could feed 5,000 from just five small bread rolls. They wouldn't listen when he said that he was not that kind of king. So he set off a, a carefully arranged plan. He sent two disciples to collect a donkey and its cult. He'd arranged a password. The Lord has need of them. He rode into Jerusalem on the colt, which had never previously been ridden. Every offering, every sacrifice had to be perfect, had to be without blemish. Lambs, bulls, doves, all had to be of the highest standard and without blemish. Jesus was born of a virgin. He was buried in a new tomb, one that had never been used. And here on Palm Sunday, he rides a donkey that had never previously been ridden. This is his deliberate claim to be king, deliberately fulfilling the picture of Zechariah 9.9. Even here, Jesus underlined what kind of kingship he claimed. Donkeys in Palestine are not lowly beasts or objects of fun as they are in England. The donkey there is a noble animal. It's only in wars that the kings would ride horses. When they were coming in peace, they would ride a donkey. Even today, the poorer Palestinian peasants, uh, the most, uh, for them, the most used form of transport is the donkey. The first time I went to Jerusalem, I was almost run down uh, and flattened by a mad teenage donkey rider in the narrow streets of the old city of Jerusalem. In normal times, you see them around Jerusalem. You certainly see dozens every day making their way to the markets in places like Hebron, Bethlehem and other West Bank towns. Jesus, the King of love, the King of peace, was not coming as a, a conquering military hero that the mob expected and awaited. He was coming in peace. This was an act of great de defiance and superlative courage. There was a price on his head. He was going to Jerusalem. And he, if he was going there, uh, where there was this price on his head, you would have expected him to slip in at night, 
hide away secretly in some back streets. For three years he hadn't wanted people to disclose the fact that he was the Christ. When Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus says, yes I am, but don't tell anyone. When he raised Joris' daughter, he said, don't tell anyone what I've done. When he cured a man from leprosy, when he healed two blind beggars, and at the transfiguration, when his disciples heard a voice from heaven speaking about him, he always said, don't tell anyone what has happened. They mustn't know the full story yet. But here on Palm Sunday, it was a time, it was the time for the world to know that Jesus Christ is Lord, the Son of God, the King of Peace, the King of Love. And to show this, he rides into Jerusalem in state on a donkey. Now, of course, not everyone who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey was claiming to be the Messiah. But according to the prophecy of Isaiah, the Messiah would open the eyes of the blind. He would loose the tongue of the dumb. He would unlock the ears of the deaf and make the lame walk. And Jesus had done all that and the people knew it. And according to the prophecy of Zechariah, the Messiah who had done all these things that Jesus had done, would also ride into Jerusalem publicly on a donkey. And Jesus was doing that. Everyone recognised that Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Crowds were lining the route. Some had come many miles with him. Some joined on the way. Some even in Bethany. Crowds were also spreading out from Jerusalem. They would have to go out of what is now called the Lion Gate or St Stephen's Gate, down into the valley, then up a very steep um, hill to the top. Crowds were spreading out to catch a glimpse, uh, catch an early glimpse of him and the other arrivals. It was a carnival type atmosphere. And the people were cheering almost anything that moved. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and they certainly cheered him. It's a poor illustration, but just imagine some football fans who have followed their team in every round of the cup. And they've got to the cup final and it's nil-nil with just a couple of minutes to go when their team scores and almost immediately there's the final whistle and they shout and they cheer they followed all the way and now this is the end victory is theirs and this crowd cheering Jesus thought that they shouted Hosanna or as they would have done in their language Hoshiana Hoshiana which is roughly the equivalent of God save the king it literally means save us now. Not just give us salvation, but also save us from the Romans now. Forgive another football illustration and being a Millwall supporter, this one is more likely. You can imagine the supporters getting behind their team during the first half. And everything is going well and the crowd sings, we'll support you ever more. And then something changes at half time. And during the second half, things go wrong. And the opponents score. And the fans realise that their the fans realise that their team doesn't look like winning. And they start to sing, What a load of rubbish. And this is the same crowd who shouted Hosanna to Jesus on the Sunday. And later in the week, they cried out, crucify him, as he was arrested and executed. As Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, declaring himself the king, he openly accepted praise from the crowd. We read that people put their coats on the ground. They cut down palm branches to put them on the ground. They were probably waving the palm branches as well. 
And if you see any pictures of Palm Sunday, you don't see the palm branches on the ground. You see pictures waving them. While I was um, doing some studies in Jerusalem, uh, whenever there was a, a parade or a demonstration, there had to be someone at the front with a palm branch and someone at the back with a palm branch. The college I was at was in Salah Eddin Street, which is the main route into East Jerusalem, the Palestinian area. It runs down to the Herod Gate, if you know the old city. And roughly once a fortnight, there would be a, um, a demonstration coming down the road. You could hear it miles away, and the gates of the college grounds were always closed. But there was always someone at the front with a palm branch, and someone at the back with a palm branch, showing that it was in peace, so that the Israeli soldiers who were walking near them wouldn't shoot them. Every Friday afternoon in Jerusalem, the Franciscan monks, the ones with the brown habits, I wasn't going to say the dirty habits, but uh, with their brown habits, they lead uh, a parade from... Uh, well, it goes along the Via Dolorosa from the what was the Praetorium. And they stop at each of the stations of the cross. They have a, a short reading in Latin, a long prayer in Italian, and a short prayer in English. And I, I thought after I've been there a few months, I thought I ought to join them. And I went there one Friday afternoon. Now, Fridays, I always posted a letter home to Maggie once a week, Friday afternoon. And I got this letter in my pocket. And I was joining this procession, and it was slow and boring. And after three or four stations of the cross, I nipped off to go to a post box that I knew where it was. And then I thought I'd join them further round. And as I was coming back through one of the gates, I saw a prophet procession, someone at the front with the palm branch and a crowd. And I thought, well, I won't join at the front, I'll join halfway along. And I was just about to join it, and I saw that six of them were carrying an open coffin with someone in it. It wasn't the Franciscans, it was a funeral procession. Someone at the front with a palm branch, someone at the back with a palm branch. They have to have the palm branches showing its peace. Now, whether that happened in Jesus' day or not, I don't know. But people were having the palm branches showing that Jesus was coming in peace. The Pharisees asked Jesus to rebuke his disciples for encouraging the crowd. But Jesus said, if they keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. He was saying, nothing in all creation will fail to praise God the Creator when they realise what a great God he is. So, first of all, Jesus openly accepts the praise from the crowd. But secondly, amid all the joy and praising, we see Jesus becoming sad. Riding towards Jerusalem, he's left Bethany, goes up a quite a, a steep hill to, to the plateau at the top and passes Beth for Jay. Coming towards Jerusalem, gets to the brow of the hill to come down the Mount of Olives, just near the place where the church of Paternoster now stands, where the nuns make it their life work to translate the Lord's Prayer into more and more different languages, and I've got no idea why. Jesus gets his first glimpse of, of Jerusalem. As you come over that hill, you can see the southeastern corner of the old city. Jesus would have seen the magnificent temple towering above everything else. Nowadays, you see the beautiful golden dome of the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim third, Muslim's third holy site in the whole world, the place where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Isaac, Mount Moriah. And as Jesus continued riding, the whole city was set out before him. And as he viewed the city, he also foresaw its ruin, the ruin of the nation's capital, or uh, the ruin of the 
the royal city where his supporters expected him shortly to mount the throne. Excuse me. So he continues down the side of the Mount of Olives. And just before he reaches the Garden of Gethsemane, at about the point where the beautiful modern church of Dominus Flevit now stands, Jesus stopped and wept over the city. And that's what Dominus Flevit means, the Lord weeps. He wept over the city which had failed to recognise him as God's Messiah. He had come as King of peace to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of peace. Even now at the 11th hour, the Jews could accept the redemption God was offering through Jesus, but no. Jesus realises only too well that it's too late. Their persistent unbelief had blinded their eyes to their uh, remaining opportunities. It was their own fault that the way of salvation had been hidden from their sight. Has it been hidden from your sight? Jesus, at the end of that week, died on the cross for our sins. He rose again on the Sunday to give us, to prove that we have the salvation. You have to grab what he's offering with both hands. Have you done that? If you haven't, then you're lost. It's only when you accept Jesus as Lord that you will be in heaven with him. Jesus knew the people of Jerusalem, on the whole, were going to persist in their unbelief and hardness of heart. He foresees the terrible judgment to come upon them. And despite all the good he had done, all the miracles he'd performed in the past three years, they refused over and over again to believe him. They were prepared to have him save them from the Romans, but not from the wrath of God. Because of this, Jesus predicts that a time will come when the enemy will sur surround Jerusalem, barricade it, and no one will escape, nor will any food or help be allowed in, and when the inhabitants are weak through hunger, the city will be sacked and destroyed and all the people will be killed. As Jesus foresees this, <coughs> he weeps, he sobs for them because it could all be avoided. Within 40 years, in AD 70, the Romans became tired of all the political manoeuvring in Jerusalem and the many rebellions by the zealots. The city was flattened. Only the walls of Temple Mount were left. So devastated was the city that a plough was drawn across it. All the Jews were expelled from the city, not being allowed to re-enter it for 1900 years. From AD 70 to 1967, the Jews were not allowed into the old city of Jerusalem. The tragedy was that if only they had abandoned their dreams of political power and taken the peaceful way of Christ, it need never have happened. Because Jesus foresaw all this, he wept, he sobbed, or as the Greek New Testament actually says, he wailed. <clears throat> the, tears of of the tears of Jesus are tears of God when he sees the needless pain and suffering in which men involve themselves through rebellion against his will. In Jesus, God proved that he is the God of love. He is the God of righteousness. God is not mocked. Every person or nation who rejects the opportunity offered to them to be saved through Christ will receive similar judgment to what Jesus foresaw happening to Jerusalem and for which he wept. Jesus rode on into Jerusalem. The crowds were cheering and shouting. They were welcoming the one they thought was going to be their king. 
He wasn't going to be the king of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. It was too small anyway to contain his majesty. Jesus was on his way to become the saviour of the world. The tragedy is still that people today are facing judgment because they refuse to acknowledge him as king. People still rebel against his will. I remember the time when, I don't know if it was Jews or Muslims, got some black paint and daubed something around the top of the Greek Orthodox Church in the old city. They were stopped halfway through and you can see where they stopped because the paintbrush went down the wall in a long line. They were going to write death to Christians but they got stopped before they finished and all they'd had time to write was death to Christ and that's what they were talking about at Easter. So after seeing his joy at receiving the praise and the sadness which led him to weep over Jerusalem. Thirdly, we also see his anger at the state of God's house, the temple. Jesus reached Jerusalem. Somebody obviously took charge of the donkey. Jesus went to the temple. By now it's late. So he just looks around and then returns to Bethany. But what he saw angered him, that angered him so much that he planned to go straight there the next day. It was said that for the convenience of the pilgrims, cattle men and money changers set up business in the court of the Gentiles. They wouldn't be able to do that these days on Temple Mount because there are guards at the gates and there are signs saying that no one can carry anything across Temple Mount. You can have a backpack, but you can't carry your shopping as a shortcut across Temple Mount. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to sell there either. In the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where the Catholics and some Anglicans say it's Calvary, but it's obviously not, uh, the roadway going up from the Western Wall, from Temple Mount up to the Jaffa Gate passes through the grounds of the a, a Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And there always used to be a sign there. Last time I went, I wanted to take a photo of it, but the, the sign had been taken down. It was a very bad translation. And it used to say, nobody bearing a burden is allowed into the church grounds. And you can just imagine... Well, I actually meant no one could carry goods through there. But you can just imagine that the people in those days were saying no one carrying a burden is allowed to come. But Jesus loved them and he wanted to take their burdens for them. At that place in the temple court, animals were, were needed for sacrifice. And buying them there was easier than bringing them with you. They were guaranteed kosher and they wouldn't be rejected as having blemishes. But they cost ten times the normal price. The Greek and Roman money of the pilgrims had to be exchanged for the right currency for the temple tax. People accepted this, but they were charged exorbitant commission for exchanging it. Jesus said, my father's house will be called a house of prayer. I don't know if you know All Souls Church in Susan's Road. If you look over the um, what used to be the main door, I think they use another door now. If you look over the main door, it actually is cut into the stone. My house will be called a house of prayer. And what Jesus saw that late afternoon when he heard the noise of business in the house of prayer and when he smelt the stench of the animals in the only area of the temple where the Gentiles were allowed to worship, it made him angry, and he decided to do something. So the next day when he returns, he went back to the temple. He made a whip 
and he drove the sellers of the animals and the birds out with their wares. He overturned the tables of the money changers and there was one mad, mad panic. You can just imagine all the coins rolling along the ground, some going into the, into the um, uh, sheep and cattle's mess. And the birds that were to be sold were flying loose. Jesus was challenging the authority of the high priest who allowed all this. This was the time of build up to Passover, the celebration of their freedom from Egypt. But Jewish worship and religion had all gone wrong. People were worshipping the feast. They were worshipping the temple. They were worshipping the city. But they were not worshipping God. When God humbled himself and came to them, they he called them back to him. They only wanted his help to rid Jerusalem of the Romans. They didn't want him as saviour. Jesus accepted their praises as he, as he proclaimed himself king. He wept over Jerusalem because of the trouble he, he had foreseen coming. And he was angry at the way the pilgrims were being exploited and the Gentiles were hindered from worship. The saddest thing of all is that within days Jesus was executed as an outlaw and most of the people in Jerusalem at that time couldn't care less. Those who couldn't care less today can be certain that although Jesus still weeps for them and although Jesus still gives salvation to all who ask him, he weeps for them because he knows they're on their way to hell. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that Jesus was able to give sight to the blind, help those who couldn't speak to be able to speak. He let the deaf hear. He raised the dead. The lame were able to walk. And then he rode into Jerusalem, proclaiming himself as king. Lord, Jesus is our king. We believe in him. And Lord, if there is anyone who hasn't come to that point, let them realise who Jesus really is and that he still has his arm out, offering them salvation. Lord, let them grab hold of it with both hands and run with it today. Amen. So we're going to sing another song to end our service. Can't get the technology to work. Seems to be. Ah, there we are. Uh, we're going to sing King of Kings, Majesty.
source of the royal road that we have in the world. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm not one for, um, shall we say, dressing up. Um, I, you know, I, when many years ago when I was in another church in a different era, really, every Sunday morning I was booted and suited and a tie and all the rest of it, you know. Um, but I, I moved on from that faith and church, if you like, and, and, and I moved on from being booted and suited as well. But I do like this idea of the royal road. Because I don't deserve it. You know, the song is quite right. So, so, so thank you, Lord. Uh, just to mention, we, we have some young friends at the back here. Uh, who have been with us now for, for a few weeks, and again, it's lovely to see you. And I'm awfully sorry, but I've forgotten the lady's name. I, ha I struggle with English names, so don't worry. Can you just shout out your name for me? Vina. 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 Ah, right, Vina. Thank you, Vina. Well, it's Vina's birthday. Oh. Uh, I'm not sure what... Tomorrow. Right. So can we just wish her a happy birthday? And she asked that we pray for her after the service. So uh, if any of you uh, feel like you'd like to do that and join us, that, that would be great. Okay. Well, the Lord bless you. Have a good week.